evening. So um, it's Fiona Lovett here. I'm standing in for Matt, who's not able to chair tonight. And I uh, just this welcome you to this is the last in our current series of the Sheep Vet Sheep Veterinary Society webinars. And I'd like to welcome Phil Scott, who's talking about um, the diagnosis and management of neurological disorders in sheep. So over to you, Phil. Great. Thanks, Fiona, and good evening, everyone. So in the next hour or so, I would like to not describe every neurological disorder we can encounter in sheep, but sell you or attempt to the concept of localization of neurological diseases within the central nervous system and then working out the most likely cause with further investigation from CSF sampling, etc. So this lamb is a very good example of a condition we may not have seen before. The animal, the lamb, was normal for the first four days of life and then presented with tetraparesis. And looking at the lamb, there is perhaps the suggestion of cervical pain. So if we think of the conditions that can affect and cause these neurological signs, we may well not have read anything about this. So where do we go from here? Well, if we localize the lesion and then work out the likely possibility, so in this animal, the most likely possibility would be an occipital joint infection causing compression of the cervical spinal cord, causing weakness of all four limbs. And we could test that by measuring cerebrospinal uh, fluid protein concentration on a lumbar sample. And then knowing that the most likely cause of the joint infection is streptoscalactiae, this is the same lamb six hours later following intravenous corticosteroid and penicillin injection. So never having seen that condition before, we can work out the problem from first principles and just applying uh, basic anatomical knowledge. And if we move on to the next example, again, we may never have seen this condition before, and if simply trying to recollect a list of clinical signs proves very difficult. So with this cheviot U, if we go through the likely neuroanatomical location of the lesion and then investigate it further, so the animal's in very poor conditions, dull and depressed. Uh, you can see he's got reduced room and fill, and it's been losing weight for about four to six weeks. It was treated by the farmer for suspected polio and cephalomalacia, and is demonstrated by our undergraduate students. It's got a bilateral lack of menace response. We can't see any trigeminal facial nerve paralysis, no head tilt, but the critical uh, part of the neurological examination is coming up where we can see bilateral lack of a pupillary light reflex. So this places the lesion either within the eye, the optic nerve, or at the optic chiasma. And the most likely lesion, as demonstrated here, is a pituitary gland abscess, sorry, a pituitary gland tumor. I was getting ahead of myself. So we can work out the location and the likely etiology just based on the neuroanatomical location and the signalment, duration of clinical signs, slow progression over time. An abscess would be a possibility, but it would be an unusual location, and more usually a basilar empyema or pituitary abscess tends to extend to involve um, other cranial nerves, and I'll show you that in a moment. So what I'm trying to um, convince everyone is Rather than memorize every clinical sign of all neurological diseases, which would be very difficult and remarkably boring, we can use a logical approach based upon the location of the lesion and then further investigation as to whether the lesion is toxic, inflammatory, parasitic, etc. And that's largely based on cerebrospinal fluid sampling. So we can localize the lesion to an area of the brain and then where appropriate collect a CSF sample, and that's usually from the lumbar uh, space. And if you're looking for a text on this subject, the one I would recommend is the Vet Clinics of North America, which is edited by Peter Constable. And this comes up with a very similar 
logical approach where we look at the breed, age, sex, etc., of the patient, its history, the neuroanatomic location of the lesions, differential diagnosis list, and ancillary tests. So if I can just show you how I was taught uh, more than 30 years ago, um, this was an article published in the vet record which describes ataxia and head tremor in an alpaca. And it lists the important clinical signs. And I know I'm going through this quickly, but you can access it if you wish. And the differential diagnoses considered were a whole host um, of highly unlikely diagnoses based upon the clinical signs. Those clinical signs would in no way suggest um, something like spinal abscessations, listeriosis, otitis media, whatever. So the way um, that neurology um, veterinary medicine even was taught 30 years ago was the most important aspect of the examination was to come up with a, an exhaustive differential diagnosis list, and the more obscure the better, whereas you can much more easily localize the lesion to a particular area of the brain. But if we just continue with this paper, the treatments administered included long-acting oxytet, vitamin B1, copper oxide, ivermectin, vitamin E, and even ear drops. Now, not one of those treatments would have been effective, say, against meningitis or an encephalitis, polioencephalomalacia, malacia, etc. These treatments were not and would not have been effective. However, the author's conclusions was that their approach was frustration modified by a successful outcome and a rational, if unproven, therapy to others. Now, that's, in my opinion, pure nonsense. And indeed, this alpaca had right grass staggers and improved despite treatment. So what I'm trying to convince you guys of is we can localize the lesion and reduce our differential diagnoses a great deal and thereby come up with specific treatments. And if I can just give you one more example, this is a, a Charolais bull that presents with these clinical signs or neurological signs. So if we look at the area of the brain that could be affected, it would be rather unusual to have two areas of the brain affected. And there would be quite a large area of the brain uh, affected in this particular animal if we're talking about the actual brain being affected. But then you remember from old Septimus Sisson the position of the pituitary gland, and in particular the circle of Willis. So if we look at where the cranial nerves exit the brain along the cranial vault, and this is the position of the pituitary gland, if we superimpose upon those cranial nerves infection extending from the circle of Willis, which surrounds the pituitary gland, you can see that all of the clinical signs manifest by that Charolais bull could be readily explained by a lesion outlined here in yellow. So this is, or the Charolais bull showed, the classical clinical signs of basilar empyema or pituitary gland abscess, and he responded very well to antibiotic therapy. So rather than memorize the clinical signs, we can work out and localize the lesion by a knowledge of the cranial nerves and where the lesion is. And moving on to an example in a sheep. So knowing that the circle of Willis takes blood vessels which drain the sinuses, uh, etc. So having diagnosed the basilar empyema in the sheep, which is unreported in many textbooks, we know then to look for the likely source of an infection. And while the bull is recent nose ringing, in this sheep with basilar empyema, we can see an extensive frontal sinusitis. And if we go on to remove the brain, so this is the brain from that sheep and a view of the ventral surface of the brain. And what I've tried to do is match it to a diagram of the brain so we can see the cranial nerves and where the infection extends to in relation to those cranial nerves. So we can readily explain why the sheep may 